Hello. Uh, thanks all for coming and learning about a, a new uh, form of agriculture um, where we're trying to uh, automate, scale, and use data to do that in a smart way. My name is Marianne Hogeveen, and I'm a staff data scientist uh, at Bowery Farming. Um, we have a small but very um, effective data team uh, that where we have uh, mainly uh, two specializations, uh, one in the agricultural side and one in the supply chain optimization side. And I'm in the supply chain and the operations side. So the reason why we exist uh, as a company is mainly because of a few challenges that uh, in, our, like, in our planet, in our finite planet, we're going to uh, be facing uh, very soon. Uh, namely, population growth, but also population is moving uh, increasingly to cities. Um, which means, well, a larger population means we have to feed everyone. Uh, and that means a dramatic increase in uh, agricultural output is needed. Um, and traditional farming, uh, traditional farmland is uh, another finite resource. And it's, uh, it's going to be difficult to uh, rely just on that to, uh, uh, to feed everyone. Oh. Ah. Uh, also, already uh, traditional farming uses a lot of land and other resources such as water. It actually uses 70% of the world's uh, fresh water. Um, and uh, that, that's something that uh, just uh, won't scale with our population. So what we need is a way to produce healthy food for everyone uh, while saving water uh, and reducing agricultural uh, impact on the environment uh, so that we can hopefully protect our environment for future generations. And um, our, uh, our uh, way of, of doing that is growing near cities, which, uh, um, which reduces, uh, well, it reduces food waste by making sure that you can get produce to uh, cities faster. Uh, and also, of course, uh, there's less shipping involved. Uh, and in a way uh, that doesn't use pesticides uh, and, you know, so you can protect insects and bees that are uh, important uh, and use uh, much less uh, water than uh, traditional agriculture that's in soil. So that's the, so that's the goal. We, want to have a, uh, we need to have a way to drastically increase uh, agricultural output, but do that in a way that we reduce uh, its footprint. Um, so the, the, the model I'm using for this is another uh, revolution. That's the industrial revolution where uh, uh, people learned to, uh, to develop goods in a, in a very reli reliable, cheap and fast way uh, using automation. So, I'm sorry. Um, and looking at, uh, at it in this model, um, we, uh, we try to build uh, efficient, automated farms um, that are vertical, so they use space efficiently, which means also that you can build them near cities. Um, indoor means that uh, you, are, uh, you, you don't have seasons, you don't have uh, unreliable uh, environments, uh, weather conditions, so you can control the environment and you can uh, drastically increase yield uh, that way. Um, you can see uh, here uh, the, the racks we have. You can see that we're very efficient with space. And we can produce, uh, yeah, we can produce year round. We have 100 times the yield per square foot of uh, traditional uh, farms. Uh, and using automation and uh, smart farming, which I'll explain later, uh, we, we managed to achieve uh, a very high yield. So what is that smart farming? Uh, well. Uh, the first uh, thing is uh, a detailed control of the growing environment for crops. So every, uh, we, we learn a lot about crops by observing them and we learn exactly uh, how, they're controlled, uh, how their environment should be controlled for them to grow uh, as much mass as possible in a short amount of time. Um, we also do a lot of uh, experiments. So if you, if, you have, if you grow outside in the field, you have a season that you can grow in. So you can maybe grow a few crops and that's it. 
Uh, you can learn from that year over year, but we start a new uh, experiment, you could say every day, because we plant new seeds every day and that goes the whole year around. So, and also they grow faster, so we have a lot of data, um, a, lo a lot of chances to optimize how we grow crops, uh, what we call a recipe for growing them. Um, and what you can see also uh, in this video, which I will play now, is how we use, is it playing? Yeah. Um, how we use techniques like computer vision to, uh, to really scale uh, observations that you can do on your crops. So what you see here on the left side of the screen is um, the actual basil that we're growing, and on the right you see uh, a neural network output that is classifying what is part of the canopy area and what isn't. And below you see uh, measurements uh, of the... Of, of the you see the output of the canopy area. So you can use, for example, um, estimates of canopy area to, to say, well, I think the yield is going to be this high of this crop. And you can do that, uh, you can try to predict as soon as you can in, the, in its growing cycle already what, what the final yield is going to be. Of course, there are a lot of other things you can also uh, measure using computer vision. You can monitor their health, you can uh, monitor a lot of things about your crop all the time. Uh, so that feeds, all these things kind of feed into each other. You can react with your automation, uh, your automated environment control. You can react to what you see in these images. Uh, and you can, uh, and you have a lot of data for your, uh, for your experiments. Uh, but what I would like to talk about is how we make this possible. Uh, so, how do we make our supply chain uh, smarter? And I'll talk about just one, one example of a recent project I worked on. So our supply chain looks, uh, in a simplistic form, looks like this. Um, first you plan how you're going to use your space. Uh, you plan what you're going to grow, what you think customers will need, uh, and you seed it. Uh, it goes into the racks that we have in our grow room. It's harvested, uh, the harvest uh, products get packed, maybe some of them will be combined into uh, mixes and we ship them. And then we f close the feedback loop by uh, analyzing the, the data we have, analyzing how much yield we got, uh, how much product we sold, and forecasting again to feed back into the plan that we're making. And every of these steps can be made smarter. So you can, of course, improve your uh, analyses and your forecasts. Uh, your plan can, uh, can maximize uh, the use of crops that will deliver the most, uh, that will be the most valuable. You can pack in a way that you can, uh, you can uh, get the most value out of your product. But what I'm going to talk about is the, well, you could say the main, the main part of our business, which is growing these crops. So, one thing that's very important, if you look at all the experiments we run, where we say, all right, we, we're trying to control the environment that the crops are growing in and optimizing for, for the best possible recipe. We're uh, doing experiments, which means we are searching through all the space of all the possible ways you can grow them. Uh, what's very important there is then where you place crops. So we are... Um, you know, we have a detailed idea or a detailed view of the uh, environment of every part of our grow room. They're not all the same, all the positions. So new crop coming in, we want to put it in the best possible environment or an environment that we want to test for it. So this is the, 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 the problem of crop placements. New crop is coming into the grow room after a harvest has been taken out. Or it could be that during its growth, you detect something or you have decided, all right, I want to try it under pink lights for a while and then maybe not pink lights. So it could also be that you want to uh, move things around in your grow room. Um, so what you, uh, what you use is all the information you have about your, uh, about your positions in the grow room. For example, we measure temperature, we have some desired range and we can see whether we're staying within that. Um, we can, uh, we can see also, um, for
for example, what the humidity is everywhere. I just picked a few uh, positions to show that for. And we can check how the, how the irrigation is working, among other things. Uh, but we also know, of course, a lot about our crop. So there are things we know just because of the, the type of crop, but there are also, of course, individual measurements that we continuously take in. So maybe some crop uh, don't, uh, well, they really need to have a night time. You know, you can increase your output by just giving them light the whole time, but some crop actually need a night time. But maybe others don't. Um, maybe two shouldn't be near each other. That could be because of the nighttime thing. Maybe if one needs, needs to have a nighttime, it doesn't want to have light leakage from the other one. Um, some of them want to be in those warmer spots, uh, which are in certain parts of the grow room. Uh, and some of them will be, want to be in colder ones or, you know, different temperature profile. Uh, but it could also be that you're observing that it's growing faster than you expected or that it's actually looking a bit stressed. So that might also be reasons to, uh, to move things around. So the problem uh, is this. You have all your crops that are coming in in the day or that maybe need to be moved. And then you have all the positions and you try to uh, find a, a perfect matching between the bipartite graph of these two, uh, of these two groups. Um, so the way you do this is using discrete optimization. Um, I used Google OR tools, but there are many, many solvers out there that you can use. Um, I mainly uh, use that for ease of use uh, to, to, to get started quickly. And what you want to do is you want to minimize some kind of cost, you could say, or maximize some kind of gain while uh, staying within uh, some boundaries that you set. So you can say, for example, I don't want to have crops in their uh, wrong environment, maybe especially not if they're important crops somehow, like high value crops or they're older crops, so maybe they're more sensitive, so they really need to be in their perfect environment. And then maybe some other uh, younger crops can still, uh, uh, maybe they don't get everything that they want. And a few things in this, uh, in this project that I would like to uh, share with you as lessons are uh, one thing that any, any of these projects in companies where a lot of things uh, are changing all the time is that you probably want to start with a very simple design where you make a lot of assumptions about, about what the solution should look like and how it's going to be used and how it's going to work, but you do want to keep track of them. So advantages of a simple solution means, of course, that you can iterate very quickly. I mean, I think you probably all have a lot of experience with the advantages of that. Um, because it could be that this actually happened that you discover that there are things that other parts of the business need to be need to solve data that needs to be collected or processes that actually need to be ironed out uh, before you can actually start implementing this but it could also be of course that you're building the wrong thing that it that your assumptions were wrong so you want to test that as soon as possible and you want to demonstrate value earlier because uh, the sooner you close the loop, the more people are bought in and the more people are actually going to be using your product and uh, advocating for it. But that does mean that there are assumptions uh, that can break. So for example, uh, we have a simple design. Uh, these, these graphs that you're solving, we were building farms at scale, very big farms. So that means a lot of crop are always on the move and a lot of uh, positions that they can choose from. Uh, but there's so, that, so these problems are computationally very uh, complex, especially if your cost function becomes uh, very complex. So you want to find symmetries, uh, and you want to remove those symmetries from your problem. So for example, a symmetry is if you have 10 identical crops coming in, of course, uh, you know, it's, they're interchangeable. It doesn't matter uh, exactly uh, which one goes into which position if you found a group of good positions for them. So it may, you may uh, simplify your problem by just grouping them together. Um, oh. But that does mean that if you do it this way that you are treating a similar crop the same, which may not be the case. You may want to have uh, explore the space of options a little bit more. 
Uh, another thing I learned was that it's very important, um, which sounds a bit strange maybe from a data scientist trying to automate uh, processes, uh, that we have to also invest in manual solutions. Um, and the reason is that when you're automating a changing process, that, that already sounds a bit, uh, that, that, that's a hard problem in itself, and things are always going to break, assumptions are going to fail, um, the way people do things are going to change, uh, and people are going to interact with your product maybe in, uh, in unpredictable ways. Um, but it's also useful uh, to, uh, to do this. It's also useful to have manual solutions first, uh, because it, uh, it gives you a bit of time to, to observe how people will solve this problem, um, which gives you a good baseline, something either people are really good at it, but you just don't have the time to, uh, to do that at scale. Uh, and you can try to emulate what you do, or maybe you, know, you, you, you have a, a baseline that you can beat. Um, and they can, they can, if they do it really well, you can uh, inform your algorithm with the choices they make. Uh, an example of something that happened uh, in our case uh, of things breaking and assumptions failing was, well, say something breaks in our processing room, let's say this is some kind of machine equipment thing and it breaks and our harvests don't get done. Well, that means that our grow room, uh, positions in our grow room don't get emptied out. Uh, and that means if new crop are coming in, they don't, have, uh, they don't necessarily all have a place to go. So you have spent a lot of time trying to figure out the best, solve this big problem, uh, find the best position for everyone, and then some of them aren't free. Um, so the way you can uh, do that is by saying, all right, I have this solution. It doesn't really work anymore because not all the crops are going are gonna to have a home. So a manual tool could, for example, remove all the infeasible ones and uh, just highlight the important information about the positions that, uh, about positions that are available so that humans can just uh, solve it quickly. Um, but that doesn't mean that uh, things should never break, um, especially if you're uh, a, growing a growing company like ours and you're scaling quickly and you're already quite big, but you're, you're going to get much bigger soon. Uh, it might be better to, uh, you know, try to try to scale, uh, uh, try to break things before you have s uh, scaled up completely, because uh, you know processes can be complex, and you'd probably much rather uh, try to break things now, see what happens, see if you can recover from it, and and techniques for doing that, building all the manual tools you need for that, um, before before it becomes a big problem, because. If you break things now, it's expensive, but if you break things later, it can be uh, a, a much bigger problem. But you have to, of course, make sure that you learn from, uh, learn from these things. Um, so finally, um, I would like to end with a, a note of something, something I tend to say, well, pretty much every day at work, which is that it's Notoriously difficult to automate a changing process, and that's uh, kind of, I think, the main takeaway from smart farming or uh, or uh, growing uh, growing a scalable scalable data-driven process in a farm. That's uh, if you automate something that's always changing. Uh, that's a that that's a, an interesting but challenging problem. Um, yep. Thank you.